I'm thankful for all the music of the morning. Our handbells are wonderful. We appreciate you so much. And what a choir. You not only sing beautifully, you look beautiful. You're a good looking group up there. Nathan, Ken, thank you. Thank you for all the music. Isn't this place beautiful? Let me thank everyone who put in a poinsettia. They are just gorgeous. I came up yesterday and did some work and came in the sanctuary and it was decorated for tonight. If you think it's pretty now, just wait until this evening. I hope you'll be here for the pops tonight. Now, I'm really stepping out sacrificially to say this, but <clears throat> congratulations, Alabama. Now, moving on. <laughs> Do we have any Alabama fans here? Just a few, just a few, just a few. Oh, oh okay, okay. May the Lord forgive you of your sin. Anyway, <laughs> how many Clemson people do we have? Number one in the whole U.S., number one. All right, congratulations to you. And how about our new coach? I tell you, yeah. Well, um, I, hope everything <laughs> I hope that's going to work out well for next year. Well, I want you to know I'm safer in every moment that we are with Jenna Mobley Kennedy because next Sunday is her last Sunday with us. And we'll be paying special tribute and honor to her, so I hope you'll be here next week. Jenna, we love you and look forward to sending you off to Dunwoody in high fashion. Well, I love to read from Luke's Gospel. One of the reasons I like Luke is, in contrast, say, to the Gospel of Mark, the writer of Mark's Gospel is in such a hurry to get to the point, he leaves out a whole lot of things. It's the shortest of the Gospels, it's the oldest. And he just wants to get there real quickly, where Luke, on the other hand, takes his time and he gives us a lot of flowery language. Now, did you notice how this scripture for today began? It began, now see if you're gonna quote this this week. In the 15th year, the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was the ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region, blah, 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 blah. What are you going to do with that? Seems kind of boring, doesn't it? It's like, get to the point. I think if I had written that, I would have said, the word of God came to John in the wilderness. You know? Move on with it. Are you ever with people who just take hours to get to the point? I want you to know, when I read this in study, I couldn't help but think of one of my mother's friends. When I was in seminary, I lived at home those three years. And my mother had this close friend, she's gone on now, but sweet, wonderful, I loved her to death, but she was the, first of all, the slowest talking person I'd ever known in my life. And she just went on and on and on. Now, young people back in that day, back in the day when I was in seminary, we didn't have cell phones, nor did we have phones that would tell you who was calling. So when the phone rang, I know this is surprising you, you didn't know who was on the other end until you picked up the receiver. That's how it was. And usually when the phone rang, mother was cooking, and so I would pick up the phone, and it was usually Dorcas. And Dorcas had this slow voice, D, this is Dorcas. And <laughs> she would say, this is, I'll give you an example. She would say, I need to talk to your mother about a recipe for squash that I'm cooking. I'm cooking it along with some ham. I've got cabbage and sweet potatoes on. And I was just wondering what kind of cheese she used on her squash. I went to the store at two o'clock this afternoon <laughs> and I picked up several kinds of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and finally she'd say, I just wondered if your mom's home, if I could speak to her. And I would say, you bet. <laughs> you ever had someone like that? Just say, get to the point. We love Dorcas. And she was really a good cook. She and mother shared a lot of recipes. Well, listen, I wouldn't know Dorcas very well if I didn't know her personality. That's how she was when you were in her presence. And we grew to love her, and she was wonderful, and that's just who she was. She couldn't say hello in less than 50 words. But that was just her. 
But I want you to know these words that seem so unimportant in Luke's gospel are actually very, very important. What Luke is doing is telling the reader, in his day, anyone who read this would pick up right away what he was saying. These are evil people. It's a wicked time. There's a lot of corruption. These are bad days. And he's drawing out to tell you who all these people are that are in power. And then he says, but the word of God, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And then Luke comes to the point. In the midst of all this corruption and all the wickedness and all this going on in the world, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. We're traveling the path to Christmas these Sundays of Advent, and it's important that we're prepared. One of the great movies that's going to come on about every other day from now until Christmas is over is the old movie, Home Alone. You remember that movie? Everybody's seen Home Alone. The family gets ready to go to Europe, and they get everything ready. They get in the vans, they get on the plane, and they arrive in Europe only to discover they had left one of their sons at home. He's missing. They really didn't prepare well, did they? Now, I don't know about your mother, but when we were on vacation, my mother inspected our suitcases. She made sure that we had everything we needed because there weren't a lot of stores that you stopped in on the road on the way. You had to have your toothbrush, toothpaste, and all that sort of stuff. But that wasn't the only thing mother prepared us for. Because we lived in parsonages, and when we were on vacation, I think I've told you this, we started a month ahead of time cleaning the house. Because there was a parsonage committee, and they would come in sometimes unannounced just to see how we lived. Thank goodness we don't have one of those in this church, and we live in a parsonage. We're so thankful there's not a parsonage committee. Did I hear an amen from my wife on the front row? Amen, that's right. <laughs> But mother always was very prepared because she thought if something happened to us when we were on vacation, this, I could just hear mother saying it. We'd say, mother, why do we go through all this all the time? Well, if something happened to us, I'm not going to have the parsonage committee coming in saying, well, look how tech shall not live. This place is a dump. This is a mess. She wanted everything to be in place, everything very prepared. The Boy Scout motto is be prepared, right? Well, what does it mean to be prepared? One person <laughs> said that he stayed ready to keep from getting ready. I like that. Stay ready so you keep you from having to get ready. Jesus talked about preparedness in several places. Let me just read a couple. One, he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost of it to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and he will ask for terms of peace. Jesus is teaching us to think ahead, to plan ahead, to consider the consequences, to be prepared. When we're prepared, it relieves stress. If you're feeling stressful this season, take a step back and ask, how prepared are you? How prepared are you? When we're prepared for the coming of Christ at Christmas, it eliminates stress. It eliminates the chaos in our lives. And it helps us to be able to concentrate on others. When we're prepared, we can help other people. This church is as prepared as I know of any church for whatever happens. We have, and you notice when you walk through the buildings, there are first aid kits everywhere. We have two defibrillators in case someone has a heart attack. The clergy several years ago were told that we needed to bring our cell phones in with us. I keep mine right here in my book. It says someone had a medical emergency. We could dial 911 just like that. Uh, case of threat or anything else. I carry a first aid kit in my car. Now I want you to know when my children were little and we moved to the parsonage that we lived here for all these years, their bedrooms are up on the second floor. And Candy and I went and we bought these boxes that had chain ladders in them. 
And we took each one of them and we opened it up and we said, we want you to, we want you to see this and be able to practice using it in case of a fire. And what they would do is hopefully be able to open the window up, if not, to knock it out. And that chain fits in the window in a way that they could just go down it. Those boxes are still under the bed. I keep, in our house, we have smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. And I keep my phone charged. I make sure it's charged all the time, not only because I want to be with you and hear from you, but you see, I want to be prepared for when that, have you ever had your phone ring and you can see yourself in it? You know what that means? It means FaceTime is coming. And my grandkids are calling and they want to FaceTime. I don't want to miss them. So I keep that battery charged. Now listen to what the writer of Luke's Gospel talks about when he says, prepare the way of the Lord. How do you prepare the way of the Lord? You make the pathway straight. You make the path straight. Fill up every valley, every mountain and hill, make it low. Make the crooked straight, the rough places smooth. And I love the way he ends this, so that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now, how do we make the path straight when we get off course? We turn our lives around. The word repent means to turn and go in a different direction. I was excited when I read this year that REI opted out of the craziness of Black Friday. Did y'all read that? It's the biggest sale day of the year. They said we will not do business that day because we want our employees to spend time with their families and we want our customers to spend time with theirs. I think they've probably done well since then. Some people said, oh, that was all, oh, you know, they had ulterior reasons for that. I don't know about that. What I do know is I applaud them. I applaud them. I wish more businesses did such a thing. We get so off course sometimes, we forget the people that we work with and the customers and the congregations. We get so busy. We need to sometimes step back and take time away. We're to fill every valley. How do we do that? We seek out those who are empty and we feed them. We seek out the lonely and become friends to them. We seek out those who are lost and tell them of the love of God. What's empty in our lives that needs filling with the love of God? What's empty in our lives? We're to make every mountain and hill low. Perhaps, perhaps one of the mountains in our lives this season is the mountain of debt. Too many people overbuy, they overbuy, and then the bills come in January and they wonder how it's all going to be paid. Maybe we need to live simpler lives. Perhaps the mountains that need to be made low are the mountains of anger or bitterness. Maybe we need to forgive someone because that mountain is standing in the way from us having the side of the straight path to Christmas. Maybe we need to go to someone and say, will you forgive me? We're to make the crooked straight. Make the crooked straight. How do we make the crooked straight? One thing we've got to learn to do, this may seem odd to you, is we've got to learn how to listen again. Listen. The greatest commandment is the Shema. How does it begin? Hear, hear, O Israel. Hear, listen. The Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor, Jesus said, is yourself. Listen, listen. We need to start listening more. I want to suggest that we need to put politics aside and start listening to the voice of God. We're having environmental issues. You mention the word environment, you're automatically a liberal. You mentioned the NRA, you're automatically a conservative. Can we put those aside? We need to be listening to the voice of God. How are we living our lives, not just for today, but for those to come environmentally? And you, I don't have to tell you, we've got a problem with gun violence. Now I have to tell you, I don't know the solution. I don't know that it's an either or or both and, I don't know, but we need to do a lot of listening and we need to do a lot of praying. We need to listen to God, we need to listen to one another. Our world is off track, my friends, it's way off track. 
I know you join me in weeping over what happened in California. What happened in Colorado? What happened in Florida? What's happening all over our world where terrorism and gun violence has killed the innocent? We are called to make the rough places smooth. We are called to make the crooked straight. The path to Christmas is always a straight one, but we cannot see it because our world is so off track. The man who went in the uh, Planned Parenthood clinic in Colorado claims he is a Christian. Now all the world, the nation, are looking at that situation and people are scratching their heads saying, Christian? It came out that he's an abuser, a wife beater, and now a murderer. How are we living our lives? How are we living our lives? You see, the whole purpose of Luke's, this text today, is to say, we've got to make these paths straight, these valleys filled, these mountains low, the crooked straight, the rough places smooth, so that all flesh will see the salvation of God. That's the purpose. Are our lives prepared for the coming of Christ at Christmas in such a way that others see it in us and collectively as a church? Will people through us see the salvation of God? I took a book down from my library this week. I was going through some things and I opened it up and I opened it up to this illustration. I thought this was priceless. It said, what if you read in a newspaper about a new airline? The name of it is Old World Airline. Are y'all awake? A new airline is called Old World Airline. That's interesting. Okay, just make sure you're awake. They've been in business for eight days. You pick up the phone and call, and the girl who answers is in a hurry because she's also the stewardess on the next flight. And she says, if you want to know about us, just come on over. Our fares are half price, you know. So off you go, and you arrive to see a 1944 B-17 on the runway, and a 19-year-old pilot getting in, and you ask him, what are you doing? He says, we're in a hurry, we're running behind. And the man says, how is it that you have half-rate fares? And the young pilot says, oh, we don't worry about unnecessary things like maintenance and checking gas. We serve leftovers on the flight over. You notice he has a parachute on. Now, no person in their right mind would get on such a plane. Why? Why wouldn't you get on a plane like that? They're not prepared. They weren't prepared for flight. I happened to read that, and you know what I thought to myself? That illustration is a parable of the church. It really is sort of a parable of the church. Some people are so interested in their own lives that they don't really care about anyone else, so they don't prepare for other people. So many churches live in the past. They're antiquated. They're outdated. They don't stay up with the times. They don't even think about the times. They don't even in their prayers mention anything that has to do with what's going on in civilization. My friends, the road to Christmas is about being prepared intentionality, discipline, being frugal, caring for the land, caring for one another, living as Christ for others. You know, on Christmas Eve, every year I've been the pastor of this church at Christmas Eve, after we have the beautiful lighting of the candles and the singing of Silent Night, we extinguish the candles and the lights come on and we sing the same hymn. Do you remember it? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. What's the next part? Let every room prepare for him. Let every room prepare for him. And what happens when we do that? And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. When we prepare and we make room for Christ, the world is able to see the salvation of God. All of heaven and nature singing together when we make room. Jeff Watkins, who's the chair of our church council, has gone to almost every committee in this church during his time as the chair of the, the council. 
He has said to the council and to many others, everyone in this church should attend a worship committee meeting at least one time to see what it takes to put a service together on any given Sunday. For example, now this isn't a worship service tonight, though there'll be worship elements. The Pops concert tonight, when you come in, this place is going to be phenomenal. It didn't just happen. All these lights up here, it's taken all week to get them in. These lights, decorations, everything, it's taken hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to put together. Last year we had the pops. And I went up to Nathan Frank afterwards and I said, this was fantastic. If someone asked Nathan, how long has it taken you to prepare for the pops for tonight? I want to tell you, last year I asked him, I said, well, I said, this was so great. He said, you haven't seen anything till next year. But you know, he hasn't just been planning for a year. He's been planning for the Pops all of his adult life. Ken Axelson, our organist, if you ask Ken, how long does it take him to practice for a service? He would say, my whole adult life. You don't get to play like that overnight. It takes hours and hours and years and years to be able to play like that. I've had people ask me, Dee, how long does it take to, to write a sermon? And I say, 40 years. It takes 40 years. It takes a lifetime. Why do we do all this preparation? So that people can get close to God, to see the salvation of God. The way we live our lives walking towards Christmas is not just for ourselves, but so others can see God in us and know the power of God to transform lives for good. It is the purpose of the church and the church, you and me together. You and I are to live out our faith Sunday through Sunday in such a way that the world can turn around and all the empty valleys can be filled and the mountains can be made low and the crooked can be straight and the rough place is smooth so people can see and experience the salvation of God. I want to close with a true story. Years and years ago there was an artist named Steinberg, last name Steinberg, and one day he saw this girl who was a gypsy out in the street. He was struck by her beauty and he said, would you come and let me, would you sit for me so that I can paint you? And she went in his studio and he began to paint her and she could only sit so long so she would come back from day to day. And he was working on what would become his masterpiece. It's called Christ, Christ on the cross. And one day that gypsy girl came in and sat down and she was watching him paint it and she said, that surely must have been a wicked man to be nailed to a cross. And Steinberg said, oh, no, 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 you got it all wrong. He was a good man. He was the best man who ever lived. In fact, he died for others. That little girl looked at him and said, did he die for you? Interestingly, Steinberg was not Christian. But that girl's question began to make him think. And he began to question in his heart. And it awakened him to Jesus Christ. He surrendered his life to Christ and he finished that pain in totally different the way that he had begun it. It was a masterpiece, masterful. Years after his death, a count went into the gallery in Dresden where Steinberg's painting of Christ on the cross was on exhibition. And when he looked at that painting, it spoke to him in such a powerful way that it changed the whole tenor of his life. He walked out of that gallery and gave his life to Jesus Christ. That man was Nicholas von Zinzendorf. He was the founder of the Moravian Church. Now, why on earth would the Moravians be important to us today? Well, you know, the man who started the, the Methodist Church named John Wesley came to America on a Moravian ship. It was out on the ocean. The ship was being tossed 
about in the midst of the storm. Wesley was down below, it scared him to death, and he rushed up the steps thinking he would hear the Moravian people screaming and crying and fearful for their lives. And he walked out on the deck of the ship and the Moravians were holding to the rail, singing the hymns of the church. It changed John Wesley's life. It had a profound effect on him. My friends, that's what we are called to do. We are called to live now, to change this world now, so that even generations after ours to come, those who will come can look back and see how we have helped clear the path so others can experience the salvation of God. Oh, my friends, may we live in that way. So may it be, so may it be. Amen.